let's take a look at section 9.4, the pigeonhole principle. So the pigeonhole principle says that a function from one finite set to a smaller finite set cannot be one-to-one. -one. There must be at least two elements in the domain that have the same image in the codomain. Now, if you draw an arrow diagram and put your domain as one finite set, maybe you know four elements, and the codomain be smaller than that, so let's say three elements, and then it's very easy to see that this must be true, right? There's no way to draw those four arrows from your elements in the domain pointing to the three elements in the, the codomain uh, in a way that's one-to-one. -one. It just can't be done. Um, and that's what the pigeonhole principle says. Now, this is used, even though we're talking about this in terms of functions, oftentimes in exercises where you're using the pigeonhole principle, it may not refer to a function at all. Um, generally, it'll refer to two sets, and perhaps without even describing them as sets, um, but you know the pigeonhole principle applies when you're looking at one finite set and a smaller finite set. Um, and let me give you an example. So in a, 30, in a set of 30 people, at least two of them must have the same first initial since there are 26 letters in the alphabet. Uh, now notice we don't really talk about this in necessarily using the language of sets or functions. Um, oh, I guess we do say the set of 30 people. Um, but um, what we're doing is we're comparing the size of the number of people with the number of letters. And because there are more people than letters, no matter what their first initials are, there are too few letters for them each to have their own that's not shared with anyone else in the group, right? So you can think of the domain as the 30 people the codomain as the set of letters in the alphabet, and the pigeonhole principle says that's not one-to-one. -one. Um, it can't be one-to-one. -one. So there must be at least two people that have the same first initial. Okay, now in this section, we also look at what's called the generalized pigeonhole principle, which takes the same concept, um, but goes beyond just saying there must be two that have the same letter in common or whatever the case may be. Let me show you what I mean. Um, so this is for any function f from a finite set x of n elements to a finite set y of m elements, and for any positive integer k, if k is less than n divided by m, then there is some y in the codomain such that y is the image of at least k plus 1 distinct elements of x. Okay, so this takes the pigeonhole principle we started with and generalizes it. Um, so let's look at an example using this. So suppose you read a 300 page book in eight days. Okay, if we look at the quotient eight over, uh, sorry, 30, 300 over eight, uh, that's 37.5, we can conclude that there was at least one day when you read 38 pages. So here we're using N, the number of elements in the domain is the 300 pages, M, equals eight, that's the number of days. And so if, no matter how you divide up those 300 pages among those eight days, there had to be a day when you read at least 38 pages because K here we can set as 37, that's less than 300 over eight. And the 
generalized pigeonhole principle says that there must be a day um, such that it's the image of at least k plus 1 distinct elements in x. So that in this case, that means there must be a day when you read at least 38 pages. Okay, one other thing I want to mention from this section uh, is we're given the contrapositive form of that same generalized pigeonhole principle. It looks a little different, and you might find this more useful um, when you have examples where the given information is a little bit different. So this says for any function f from a finite set x of n elements to a finite set y of m elements, and for any positive integer k, if each y and if for each y and y, um, the preimage f inverse of y has at most k elements, then x has at most k times m elements. In other words, n is less than or equal to k times m. Okay, so this would be more useful if let's say sticking with that reading example, if you knew the maximum amount that you read on each day and you knew how many days there were, then the most you could have read over that period of time is going to be the maximum pages per day times the number of days. Okay, and so that would tell you at most how much you read uh, during that span of time. Okay, um, so same concept, just uh, written out in a different way. I hope you found that all helpful. Um, we've got one more section to go, um, which is section 9.5, which gets into counting subsets of sets, combinations. This is a concept that we first saw in chapter 5, but now we revisit here in chapter 9. See you in the next video.